important to remember that the war started 10 years ago, not two years ago. So we actually are into the 11th year of conflict. And after 11 years, with Russia having every advantage, they still only really control 20%. Their Air Force and Navy have failed in all of their critical tasks, and half a million Russian soldiers have been killed. So don't, I would not focus so much on yet last year's counteroffensive, but step back from the map and think about where we are. And this was done without a strong, decisive commitment from the United States to help Ukraine win. So I actually am quite optimistic. I think that, you know, Russia is actually in deep trouble. Now, three things. Number one, we have to make it clear that we want them to win, that it is our strategic objective that Ukraine wins. Germany has to do the same thing. Make it very clear and then provide the support that's needed for them to win. Number two, uh, Ukraine needs long-range precision strike capabilities that will enable them to make Crimea untenable and that will neutralize Russia's advantage of mass. That means the capability to destroy artillery, headquarters, logistics, and long range. That's a capability that we should provide them. And then the third thing, Ukraine is going to have to fix their personnel system. They've got enough people, but they don't have enough soldiers. And so this is going to require uh, political decisions, political fixes, changing laws, and then for the government in Kiev to explain to Ukrainians why they have to get more people to expand the size of the army so that they can have enough units to rotate. First of all, we should recognize that these are threats, rester, and it's a part of the Russian repertoire uh, or their arsenal. Just like artillery, just like rockets, is disinformation, constantly threatening people. Um, and I think we in the West should quit overreacting to all of these threats, be firm in our resolve, be clear in our objective, and then push back on it. You know, the Russians will complain every time we do, but they actually only respect strength. When we are, when we cower or we're like, oh, we don't want to provoke, <laughs> that just makes them want to do more. And I don't understand why we still have a hard time uh, acting with confidence and decisiveness instead of always worrying that we might provoke them. Do you think that a, a Russian loss, a Russian failure is reasonably likely? Are, are you talking about what you think really is likely to happen here or just what could happen if... You know, uh, when I think back to the time of Reagan where there was no doubt about the United States, our stance about deterrence of the Soviet Union and, and now Russia, that they were clearly the bad guy, yet today in some people's mind seems not as clear. And there's no doubt that the bad guy is here. Uh, the Russians have killed tens of thousands of innocent Ukrainians. They have kidnapped and deported 20,000 Ukrainian children. Uh, every day uh, they use multi-million dollar precision weapons to hit civilian targets all over uh, Ukraine. So this, this is, there's no confusion about who the good guy is here and who the bad guy is, that uh, we should recognize it is in our advantage that Russia is defeated, and that could and should lead to the collapse of the current government. Now, we're going to have a big fake election on the 17th of March in Russia. Uh, Putin will be reelected re with an amazing 98 percent or something like that, and he's in office for another six years, but there's no chance of anybody overthrowing him or or him losing an election. But if Russia loses this war, then the many people who are actually very unhappy with him and the disaster that this war has meant for Russia, uh, unless you're the very, very small circle of super rich people there, um, I think that the potential for a collapse of his government, his regime, is very real. And this is not something that we should be scared of. In fact, it's something we should hope for. We should prepare for it. And I'm not talking about the United States externally trying to bring about regime collapse. We, we've got a bad record, frankly, over the past several decades of when we have tried to do this. It never turns out right because you don't know who's coming in next. Uh, but I would say uh, we should not pull our punches in helping Ukraine because we're worried that the, Rus that the uh, Putin regime might collapse, but we should prepare for it. We were not prepared in 1989 for the collapse of the Soviet Union. I, I've met nobody that in 1988 predicted, hey, next year I think they're going to collapse. We were all 
caught by surprise. And so uh, we missed the opportunity to help make the most of this so that Russia could transition into a a, a more responsible Western country. Instead, we stayed out of it other than trying to uh, do business deals. And now we've ended up with Vladimir Putin. I think we should be preparing for the possibility that the wheels are going to come off of the Russian Federation as it is. Uh, there will be a breakup. You know, there are like 72 different entities that make up the Russian Federation. It's not one big homogenous country. It's 72 different oblasts and better and states and entities. Uh, I think about half of them um, would be happy to find the chance to break away if they could sustain themselves. We'll see. So that was my point, is that uh, we shouldn't be afraid of a collapse of the of the regime, and we should prepare for that. The, the bottom line, though, the most important thing is helping Ukraine actually win, to eject Russia back to its own borders so that Russia can get in the habit of living within its own borders. In this video, General Ben Hodges provides a comprehensive analysis of the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine emphasizing the strategic failures of Russia despite its initial advantages and proposing a multifaceted approach to supporting Ukraine. His insights offer a blend of military strategy, geopolitical implications, and long-term outcomes, historical context, and misconception of conflict duration. Hodges begins with a pivotal connection to the commonly held perception regarding the conflict's timeline, emphasizing that it has been ongoing for over a decade. This is not just a semantic distinction, but a crucial framework for understanding the entire conflict. It contextualizes the resilience of Ukrainian forces and the strategic endurance they have displayed, challenging the narrative of a sudden Russian aggression and instead portraying a prolonged struggle for sovereignty and territorial integrity. This extended timeline prompts a re-evaluation of international support dynamics suggesting that the response to Ukraine's plight needs to be viewed as a reaction to a recent event but as support for a nation long besieged by an aggressive neighbor. It underlines the chronic nature of Russian expansionist policies and the sustained Ukrainian resistance against such aggression, necessitating a long-term strategic partnership rather than temporary support measures. Analysis of Russian Military Performance Hodges' critique of Russian military operations reveals a complex picture of overestimated capabilities and under-archived objectives. He highlights the stark contrast between the anticipated efficiency of the Russian military machine and its actual operational failures, evidenced by high casualty rates and the inability to secure key strategic objectives. This dissection of Russian military inadequacy serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of relying on historical repetition or superficial metrics of military strength, such as troop numbers or equipment counts. The failure of the Russian Air Force and Navy to perform their tasks not only signals operational flaws, but also suggests deeper issues of strategic planning, intelligence assessment, and command inefficiency. So, Hodges' analysis prompts a reconsideration of how military success is measured and the factors that truly contribute to operational effectiveness, including morale, leadership, logistics, and the integration of different military branches. Strategic Recommendations for Supporting Ukraine Delving into Hodges' strategic framework for supporting Ukraine reveals a multidimensional approach that balances military aid, diplomatic support, and internal reforms. His call for unequivocal support for Western nations underscores the importance of a united front in the face of aggression serving not only as a deterrent to further Russian advances, but also as a morale booster for Ukrainian forces. The emphasis on providing Ukraine with long-range precision strike capabilities highlights a strategic pivot towards uh, leveling the operational playing field. This recommendation is rooted in an understanding of modern warfare, where precision and the ability to strike high-value targets can compensate for numerical inferiority. It reflects a broader trend in military strategy that values technological sophistication and intelligence over sheer force. And Hodges' insight into the need for Ukraine to reform its military personnel system touches on a critical aspect of military readiness. The distinction between having a large population and a combat-ready force underscores the challenges of transforming societal resources into military strength. So this recommendation goes beyond the tactical needs of the conflict, suggesting a structural reform that would enhance Ukraine's long-term defense capabilities, the role of disinformation, and psychological operations. 
Hodges addresses the psychological dimension of warfare by critiquing the Western response to Russian disinformation. His analysis points to a battlefield that extends beyond physical um, confrontations, where perceptions, narratives, and information control play a pivotal role. So that perspective invites a broader understanding of modern conflicts where the manipulation of information can influence international opinion, shape political decisions, and affect the morale of both military personnel and civilian populations. And the call to counter Russian disinformation with confidence and assertiveness reflects a strategic approach to psychological warfare, emphasizing the need for resilience and proactivity in the face of attempts to sow confusion and fear. This aspect of Hodges' commentary highlights the interplay between military and non-military strategies in achieving overarching objectives. Geopolitical Implications and the Prospect of a Russian Defeat Now here, exploring the potential consequences of a Russian defeat, Hodges ventures into speculative yet critical territory, analyzing the internal and external ramifications of such an outcome. His consideration of the potential for regime change within Russia underscores the conflict's ability to influence domestic politics, echoing historical instances where military failures precipitated political transformations. So, this analysis extends the scope of the conflict's impact, suggesting that the stakes transcend the immediate territorial disputes to involve the stability and the future direction of Russian governance. Hodges' contemplation of these scenarios serves as a reminder of the profound interconnectedness between military conflicts and political landscapes, where the outcomes of battle can reverberate through the halls of power. Preparation for Post-Conflict Scenarios Now this is very interesting, as Hodges concludes with a forward-looking stance urging readiness for a variety of post-conflict scenarios, including the potential fragmentation of the Russian Federation. This perspective embodies strategic foresight, advocating for the anticipation of and preparation for complex outcomes that could reshape regional and global dynamics. The call for preparedness not only for military but also for diplomatic, economic, and humanitarian responses highlights the multifaceted nature of modern conflict. It underscores the need for a comprehensive strategy that addresses the immediate challenges of warfare and the long-term goals of peace, stability, and democratic governance. And with that, we come to our synthesis. So, in synthesizing Hodges' comprehensive analysis, it becomes clear that his insights offer not just a critique of the present conflict, but a blueprint for future engagement. His commentary weaves together the threads of military strategy, geopolitical analysis, and broader implications of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict presenting a vision that is both deeply informed by historical context and acutely aware of future challenges. So, Hodges' analysis serves as a clarion call for a strategic revaluation of support for Ukraine, a re-examination of military and political assumptions, and a proactive approach to shaping the post-conflict landscape. It reflects a profound understanding of the complexities of modern warfare and the intricate dance of international relations, offering a roadmap for navigating the turbulent waters of the current crisis and beyond.